Meditating is as efficient or more than having therapy? More. I would say more. More? I would say more, but meditation and therapy together is time. I said this is religion. They are all talking about the same thing, only they are saying it different. Like, there are certain verses in the Bible which say how, how you should treat your slaves. Mm. No, you don't have slaves anymore. They are irrelevant. That doesn't mean the Bible is irrelevant. Very good friend of a very good friend of mine committed suicide and died mm. in IIT. We kind of tend to overgeneralize the negative, you know. For sure, I don't want to become like them because they are not happy. So our journey is moving from one perfection to another perfection. So Baba, thank you so much. This has been an honor, pleasure. And I think one of the podcasts, which is like from the conversation to sitting across the table, this has been the fastest. <laughs> I met you yesterday and here we are. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much. Such an honor to have you in my podcast. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> I have, I thought about it, uh, you know, where do we start? What do we talk about? I think there's quite a bit. Um, so I want to start off with, um, from a mathematician to a meditation, a teacher for meditation. It's like a complete 360 degree shift and yet there is a strong connection between the logical and the intuitive mind to uh, you know the benefits of meditation which I think is also a combination of logical and intuitive mind. How did it start and before and after if you were to reflect back was there a tipping point that you would look back and say wow Baba not bad I'm very proud of you that you didn't give up in this process. <clears throat> So, I got into IIT Mumbai, IIT Bombay, it's not IIT Mumbai, uh, IIT Bombay uh, for a master's program in mathematics. Huh. And over there, I felt very let down because the teaching methodology of what I thought it would be in one of India's most premier institutions, in fact, one of the world's most premier institutions, was unfortunately exactly the same as school. Hmm. Whatever is written on the blackboard, copy it out and then go and puke it onto your answer paper in the exam. For 70% of them, yeah. uh, of the people who, I mean 70% of my course over there. Yes, the other 30%, there were some professors who were just brilliant teachers, super passionate about their subject. Um, and uh, I mean, those people made that place feel worthwhile. Hmm. I had always kind of known somewhere that there is something bigger than what you can touch, see, feel, hear, taste. And as I became a teenager and you know, you know how teenagers are, right? You know, most, most, most teenagers think they know everything. I knew I knew everything. Hmm. <laughs> You were smart. I was, yeah, considered myself smart. <laughs> and um, in IIT, so it was, it was like there were certain lectures that I was so enthusiastic about certain subjects that I really wanted to study and the others were a complete drudgery. Mm. You know, like, why am I here? But the sum total of that entire experience was like, I'm not really clear about what I'm doing here or why am I here? You know, from the outside, it is like, okay, you've got into IIT, your life is made, your, you know, everything is sorted. And for me, it was like, what's going on here? Hmm. I felt a misfit. Hmm. You know, I was not a person who was looking for a job that I had decided long time ago because my parents both worked in a corporate job, mom in ICICI, dad in uh, Tata's for their entire life. Hmm. And looking at them, I felt no way am I going to do this. Hmm. Right. Hmm. So I knew what I didn't want to do. And most of the people over there were like the job was the be all and end all of their of their studying or getting an MBA. 
I couldn't understand why a MS in math should suddenly decide to do business. Hmm. It didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Right. So I was kind of like, what do I do now? Okay, the MS will get over sooner or later. It will get over. I flunked a few times, but okay, it will it will get done. Around that time, a very good friend of a very good friend of mine committed suicide and died hmm. in IIT. He just whatever couldn't handle the pressure. That affected my friend Lot. in in a very bad way. He kept blaming himself that maybe I should have done something. Like, कल रात को तो ठीक था. हम्म. क्या हो गया पता नहीं क्या हो गया उसको. No. Could I have done something? Could he he there was a lot of blame that he kept giving on himself about hmm. it. Around the same time, you know, it's amazing how these things kind of come together. Uh, come together. A very very good friend of mine out of the blue called me. And said there is this course on breathing, and I want you to do it. Hmm. I said breathing, what breathing? She said, look, I don't have time to talk to you. I'm quote unquote. I don't have time to talk to you. I have got so many other people to call. She was very fat. If you don't come for the course, I will come home and sit on you. Hmm. I said, Ma Mary, I will come. <laughs> okay. I had no idea about the name of the course. I had no idea. Nothing I knew. And I showed up for the course. In the first ten minutes of the art of living program, I came to know later it was the art of living program. I was blown. I was like, "How come nobody taught, told me anything about this?" And somehow I felt I am home. I have reached where I need to be. Hmm. And I remember asking my teacher, Rajshri. Her name was uh, is Rajshri. I asked her in the first fifteen minutes. They gave a break. Fifteen twenty minutes ke baad they gave a break, and I went to her and asked her. How does one become a teacher of this course? And she laughed and said, "First, you complete the course." <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I became a teacher. Uh, I mean, that's how I did the course. course. And then uh, I took a lot of my friends from IIT because I felt that if one knows how to meditate yeah. and how to be able to relax at will, hmm. no way is someone going to commit suicide, hmm. right? Hmm. And so I took a lot of my friends. to the course they loved it and uh, at that time art of living didn't have any teachers in india hmm. the teachers used to come from america to teach so we would have to wait 3 months 4 months 5 months before a teacher could you know hmm. come to bombay to to teach a course and the group that got created just started insisting baba you become a teacher hmm. you no know? and so within 6 months of me doing the art of living program i was a teacher of the art of living and the rest as they say is history you know? was that the turning point that whole episode in i guess there was so many things there that frustration with the system over there uh the my friend's friend committing suicide me being utterly confused about what i want to do next in life mm. knowing these are the things i don't want to do mm. but i had no idea what i wanted to do and uh, when i looked at my seniors who had graduated i mean we used to stay in touch they were all telling me baba enjoy yourself while you are in iit after that it's really bad <laughs> i was like i'm getting screwed here <laughs> you know isse baad aur kya isse baad aur kya hone wala hai bhai mere ko you know so uh, and i thought for sure i don't want to become like them because they are not happy um, yeah so for me a big realization was that Uh, you know so i flunked a year in iit so what happened was i had one semester in this with, time frame yeah, i had one semester in which i had only one subject mm. so i had a lot of time to think <laughs> and a lot of time to explore the campus and you know you see the campus it's very, very beautiful but when you are there yeah. studying there is no time yeah you know you are yeah. rushing from one lecture to another finishing an assignment doing a quiz it's it's mad yeah and this particular semester four months i had just one lecture on friday so i totally enjoyed myself and i took that time to really think about what do i really want in my life and over and over again i found the answer as i want to be happy i want other people around me to be happy and i want to be rich hmm. but never at the cost of happiness so i'm not allergic to money hmm. i'm not allergic to wealth at all hmm. but if that wealth is going to come to me robbing me of my happiness my health and things That's that matter i don't want 
right so that kind of became a theme in my life hmm. it still is a theme in my life uh, where uh, if something makes me feel good i will say ah of course let's do it and if it pays me money on top of it oh fantastic of course <laughs> we will do it. yeah yeah right? yeah i think that uh, <laughs> it's it, you put it really beautifully because a lot of the audience that listens and watches our episodes are in the you know 20s and the 30s and maybe hovering in the early 40s as well one of the struggles is existential which is the money aspect but there's also another side of life which is your grounding and you know how you feel and the uh, life itself right so how do you balance that how do you go about balancing that so for me the techniques that i learned from the art of living the sudarshan kriya sahaj samadhi meditation the meditation the core meditation techniques the basic function of any meditation is to bring you a calm clear mind mm. any action that you take which is a function of a calm clear mind is automatically a good action yeah right yeah. now most people are either angry frustrated tired confused in their heads yeah and so the actions that they take are a function of that anger frustration tiredness etc yeah. and it is not a it's not like rocket science to figure out that they are feeling miserable about themselves Yes. and they try to change so many things they try to change their partners their jobs the cities they live in they 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 change everything except that one thing that runs everything the mind right the so if the mind the mind so if you can culture your mind and meditation is one super powerful super easy way to do it uh then life is sorted in the sense that now you are taking rational intelligent decisions instead of decisions which are run by not necessarily always positive emotions mm. Mm. i have a question here baba there is an external world and there is an internal world i think meditation is very internal whereas everything that you spoke about life career job you know spouse relationships is the external world we live mostly on the external world but this is where you're saying the you need to find the interconnection Correct. when you get into this internal world and then look outwards you have to change. realize that that internal world powers your external world and the external world affects your internal world so you have a fight with someone you really like it's going to shake you internally it's going to make you feel really bad right um you don't get that promotion you so rightly deserved and some other idiot Managed got it simply it. because he did some politics you're going to feel cheated you're going you are whatever you are you will feel really really bad yeah right yeah. now if you don't process those emotions they are going to run you and we've seen this so often one girl ditches one guy and the guy can kind of concludes all women are bad mm. <laughs> it's not true yeah the one woman you chose which was your bad choice <laughs> uh, turned out to be a rotten apple but that does not mean the 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 humanity of women are are, 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 are bad, bad people yeah right yeah. we kind of tend to over generalize the negative you know you you sit in a rickshaw and and they it takes you for a ride yeah. all rickshaw drivers in bangalore are bad how many rickshaw drivers did you sit with yeah. right yeah. so this is the kind of over generalizations that we do about the negativity that is around us yeah. and it kind of reflects into our inner atmosphere and so we kind of start nitpicking and seeing bad things because we are looking for bad things yeah, yeah. you uh, wired yourself have already. that faith in humanity anymore yeah right yeah. but if you just turn it around and there is a very interesting i think it was a harvard study where people were simply asked to write five things they are grateful for every day mm, and the, the challenge was challenge. you cannot repeat what you wrote yesterday yeah right yeah. when they did mri scans of the people who did that for 40 days their brains had physically altered like there was a physical difference in the way the brain was uh, their amygdala which is the fear center had shrunk 
where a hippocampus which which uh, is a more positive part of had, had become stronger thicker walls things like that yeah. so in 40 days of simply writing i am grateful for my father i am grateful that i have a lovely house i am grateful i got my uh, you know cup of tea today just writing that for 40 days can create a difference like that imagine what learning formal meditation and practicing it can create for you uh, what is meditation? Is it just breathing? Because I'll tell you, there are so many myths about it. Um, there's this whole, I don't know if there are myths also. Okay, so I'm coming from that novice oh, space. Absolutely. Um, for me, I believe now that it is breath work. It's not about getting focus or concentration. Earlier, it used to, my understanding was that it helps you with focus and concentration. There are others who put a lot more into it. There's spirituality, there's religion, there's everything into it. But what is meditation? Got it? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> meditation is waiting for nothing. Frustration is waiting for something. I think that was the most genius definition of meditation. That waiting I've, I've... for nothing. Oh, because your mind is so preoccupied. Meditation is about letting it go, letting it go, letting it go. Swipe, until swipe, swipe it... till there's nothing. And it's like, you know, if you have, say, a glass of water with a lot of mud in it, right? For the mud to settle, what do you do? You let it stay nothing. still. <laughs> do nothing. Do nothing. Right? You shake it up. Oh, why is this mud there? It's not going to help. The same way with the mind. You just sit and wait. And you sit and wait with your breathing techniques. So the breath is a connection between the body and the mind. Right? Talk to me a little bit about this. You right. and I have been talking about how the body and the mind are mm. connected. And we've also talked about the gut as well. Mm. Talk to me a little about this. Because I think okay. it's important to understand yes. the holistic thing. So... Um, my favorite analogy would be if you think of the mind as a kite mm. and the body as the firki, mm. the breath is the string. The string. Okay. And you will notice that when the kite is high up in the sky, it is kind of stable. But when you start reeling it down and it's lower down, you will see that it kind of goes all over the place. You cannot control it. It gets stuck in a tree and you know, things like that. Right. It's very similar with our breath. Mm. Have you noticed that? The longer breaths that you take are usually that of relaxation Yeah. or when you are happy. So if you have a flower, you smell the flower, that how do you smell go. the flower? Mm. Yes. Right? Yeah. Nobody goes. Yeah. I know one the, person who goes like that. <laughs> <laughs> the shorter breaths are usually associated with negative emotions. So your anger breath is a short breath. Your frustration breath is a short breath. Interesting. Right now, that's the key that the breath can actually create emotions in you. In fact, that's the secret of good acting. And that's why in Bharatanatyam, in our Indian classical dance forms, where they need to bring those emotions on their face, pranayam is a huge aspect of it. Oh, because only with the breath control can they bring that emotion of anger or jealousy or, or peace or happiness or whatever it is. Right. Now, if you can therefore learn to tap into the breath, you know, we, we, we say, na, count from 1 to 10 before you get angry. Mm. You count, nothing will happen. Mm. But you breathe 10 deep breaths. Yeah. yeah you, you cannot stay angry anymore. Yeah. You simply can't. Yeah. Right? So, now that's about the emotion. Now, every emotion has a sensation on the body. Mm. A feeling. A feeling. Right? So, for example, uh, when you feel gratitude, it's in your throat. In fact, the words we use, no, lump of gratitude in my throat. Mm. Mm. Right? Mm. Nobody says lump of gratitude in my tummy. Mm. It's in the throat. Yeah. Right? Um, laughter is on the tummy. Yeah. Santa Claus, big, huge belly, ho, ho, ho. Right? Yeah. Laughter. Ganesha, Lord Ganesha, big tummy. Right? So, uh, different emotions are sitting their, their, their sensations are sitting on different parts of the body. Uh, when you do get into the science of pranayama, what are you doing? You are basically integrating the body with the mind. mind. 
and therefore releasing the emotional debris that is there in the mind mm. along with releasing the physical stresses the aches and the pains that are there on the body so the breath is the connection between the body and the mind it's the thread it's the thread and so putting your attention on that uh, and breathing in particular rhythms in particular way when you do this meditation is the result of it but so when you pranayam is not meditation mm. but meditation is the effect that happens because you do pranayam so through that you will have glimpses of various things that comes in but as you go into this you're saying that will slowly eventually yeah. slow down and stop yeah. interesting why okay before that you've been doing this uh, yes plus program for the youth for a really long time now the mastermind behind that as well what are some things that a lot of the youngsters today come with um <laughs> here's what i've understood there's a lot of anxiety there's a lot of stress so a lot of focus on who am i or the individuality or identity part of it there's also confusion in right. terms of lifestyle and trying to fit in and a whole lot of things i'm trying to see this is me just understanding what i am seeing but you sort of do this day in day out what do you see no for young people na <laughs> i always say that the person who is 18 or 19 hmm. is the only one who does not want to be 18 or 19 hmm. the 13 and 14 year old they want to be 18 yeah the 35 40 year old they go oh my god i wish i was 18 <laughs> it's only the person who is 18 or 19 they don't want to be 18 or 19 because be it's it is a really stressful time in life you've got raging hormones you've got expectations that you have to manage from so many people you know there is just so much going on you know i on my 50th birthday someone asked me how how does it feel to be 50 and i said exactly like 18 minus the confusion <laughs> <laughs> doesn't get there <laughs> <laughs> so um that is where i feel that what we do living can really make a difference to people because all the things you mentioned whether it is anxiety whether it is uh where do i belong whether it is uh, what am i here for whether it is handling relationships uh, whether it is managing all the sexual thoughts and things that come up whether it is uh, figuring out how to manage expectations of you yourself having about yourself your parents your society you know all this can be handled so much better if your mind simply cooperated with you So that comes with the understanding of the power actually lies within you to our earlier conversation itself is it Yeah I mean definitely but to be able to effectively tap into that power mm-hmm. you first need a relaxed peaceful mind yeah otherwise you'll not even recognize that the power is there oh wow, what power what are you talking about i close my eyes i only see like 10000 things going on i i i right And Baba, as we go into this process of this journey, where does spirituality fit in? I'll, I'll tell you why I'm asking you this. Um, I think it was yesterday we were talking, uh, Pin and I. We don't understand spirituality. Sometimes we get confused with religion and spirituality. But then I feel it's very important to understand spirituality. We're not taught about it in school. at some point the external uh, world or the change that's happening around us forces us to look inwards and then okay really understand or step into the world of spirituality i feel it's important that we sort of inculcate that very early Absolutely. on itself because it with it comes a lot of other things like the creative world resili- uh, resilience and whole lot of other things right. now this is with my very basic understanding of spirituality so i'm curious first to understand what is spirituality and what it is not and then how early should one embark on that process and where do you start i'll tell you what i what i did once someone asked me a very i mean this all literally the same question in a huge crowd gathering huh? and i held up a bottle of water hmm. and i said what is this 
and some people shouted it's a bottle of water some people said it's it's a water bottle some people said it's a plastic bottle some people said it's a it's you know half full and hmm. i mean in a group of 100 people we got like 30 answers for what is One this bottle of water right i said this is religion they are all talking about the same thing only they are saying it differently hmm spirituality open the water drink it <laughs> right i don't care what you call it i am drinking this water it's the experience it's the experience so where religion is divisive yeah it's like my father is better than your father basically hmm. spirituality is inclusive because when i recognize that i have this shakti that is there within me at the same time i have to acknowledge that the shakti is there within all Mm. and so therefore on a uh, on a wider level uh, everybody is one mm. it's one world family what do they keep saying vasudeva kutumbakam the, the whole world is one family mm. the recognition of that comes when you realize that oh my god yeah there is that spark within me which is there within everybody mm. Mm. right mm. so for me spirituality is that which unites where religion is that which divides now i will not say that everything about religion is bad it gives us holidays it gives us christmas it gives us holy it gives us you know uh, navratri Sweet and shivratri and so religion brings a sense of celebration into our life and we have to remember that religion is relevant certain aspects of religion are relevant historically mm. like i'll give you an example If you look at Hindus, they cremate the dead. Muslims bury the dead, right? Now, have you ever thought about why? See, where did Hinduism originate? In, in the forests of India, right? Mm. Now, over there, there is just so much wood lying around. It's just convenient to bury, <laughs> burn, 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 cremate. Where did Islam come from? The deserts. Now over there, if you want to burn a cremate, you are going to one OSS will go every time someone dies. <laughs> so it just makes sense to. What happened to Parsis? They went up there to the sun. Beg your pardon? How did the Parsis figure out the, the sun? The Parsis we feed uh, the body to the vultures. Vultures. Yeah. How did that? Well, we'll just be part of nature. Again, uh, so Rastanism came up came came up about in uh, you know the areas of Egypt, Iraq, Iran, which are now. Uh, uh, So, so when you look at it in that uh, that sense, mm. in a historical sense, mm. uh, it makes a lot of sense. So it's what you are used to. Correct set of so practices. So now you you kind of dogmatize that and say, "Oh my God, if you don't do this, then that is where the foolishness is." Has it lost its purpose? Yeah, now? it has. It has. It has. I will not say it. religion has lost its purpose i will say aspects of religion which are historical in nature have lost its purpose like there are, there are certain verses in the bible which say how it, how you should treat your slaves mm. no you don't have slaves anymore they are irrelevant that doesn't mean the bible is irrelevant yeah the situation it is it is situ at that time that was what was required that was what was given yeah do you see the interconnection between the fundamentals of mathematics to what you're seeing with how uh, <coughs> meditation is bringing this together as change in a human being so a lot of um, advanced mathematics requires a lot of intuition hmm uh, you know you kind of hypothesize the solution and then work backwards and many times if the hypothesis is not right then you will have a few months of struggle until you realize oh my god that beginning thing only was wrong mm. so as a meditator i found i could create those hypotheses with much higher accuracy than anybody else give me an example can you uh stu i don't even remember anymore okay but um, uh, some of my favorite the- uh, subjects were graph theory combinatorics things like that where um, you know you would you would need to really intuit Hmm. a result hmm uh and then kind of prove it hmm now if you started wrong you intuited it wrong of course at the end you would know okay that was wrong but who wants to be 
proved that what wrong. they said was wrong four months down the line. Yeah. So it's just nicer if you can intuit it Certainly. more accurately Earlier. to begin with. Hmm. That's where it helped me a lot. Uh, you know, a lot of my professors were always surprised. How how did you decide this? And my answer would be, I don't know. And one of my professors was, you are talking like Ramanujan. So hmm. I'm nowhere near close to that guy. But yeah, he was also tapping into the same infinite uh, energies or knowledge that is there and, and pulling that out. Hmm. And that's why many of the things that Ramanujam said still don't have proof. He didn't have a proof, but he just knew, ah, yeah, theek hai. it was the same with me. I could pull out stuff uh, from the ether hmm. and say, I don't, don't ask me why I'm saying this is it, but I know this is it. And this applies to... The journey and change in or Everything your life itself. Life. So you become a lot more intuitive. Is yeah, that? Absolutely. And then that but allows. But you're cooking. You, you know, they always ask me, how much salt do you put? I say, you put enough. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Come Were to an order living cooking? course, then you'll know. <laughs> Were you always cooking? I, yeah, I, I enjoy the alchemy of cooking. How young were you when you started? Oh, six or seven years old. Really? Yeah. Uh, what you were it, in the kitchen as a yeah, young boy yeah, as, a, as a very young person because I would be so intrigued you know except for example you take olive oil mm. and you have that it tastes yuck and you just eat some basil leaves and they okay basil tastes all right and then you take garlic and eat it by, by itself right but you put olive oil garlic and basil together and it tastes amazing it's like creating gold you know cooking is alchemy <laughs> so how did you get into cooking at six? I just, I guess I just like being in the kitchen. I, it, it always fascinated. Was mom a good cook? No. <laughs> no oh, that was a very quick was. no. <laughs> <laughs> she used to, she used to like, she was that, abhi khana banana hai to bana dete, you know, uh, it was like, she could cook well if she wanted she to, but she never well. wanted to. Yeah. And I guess that's why I, I became such a good cook because I really enjoy good food. Oh, nice. Nice. And then you became a vegan at some point. Yeah. Yesterday we were talking about that. Uh, how did that really <coughs> change? Because so I've been you've a, been a hardcore non-vegetarian before? 30 years ago. Um, when I did the Art of Living course, it was suggested on the course that for the duration of the course, you don't eat any non-veg food. Okay. Now, all my life, somehow, I've never really liked non-veg food. You know, I would say, for example, have the gravy, I would not have the chicken. Mm. You know, mm. Sometimes I would actually, uh, it became more a competition with my sister. She should not get it, so I will eat it. It was like that. You mm. know? Uh, you know, because she would say, anyway, you don't like it, at meat. No, 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 I will eat. Mm. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so I, I kind of... In that five days of the course, you know, I, I told at home that, look, in the course, they said I'm not supposed to eat. So mm. let's be vegetarian. Ah, yeah, OK, don't eat. I mean, Parsis do have a lot of non-veg, but we also have a very uh, interesting cuisine yeah. called completely vegetarian yeah. food. Five days later, I was feeling just so much nicer about me. Mm. Uh, of course, the meditation helped. Sudarshan Kriya blew me. Mm. But I think the diet was also an integral part of the experience. And so I thought, okay, another month, another month. And then suddenly I didn't feel like eating it anymore. I just didn't want to eat it. And then I started doing research on it and I realized that it, it, it is not good for the environment at all. I realized that it can cause a lot of very unpleasant health conditions. Hmm. I mean, uh, we, we talk about epigenetics, which is where the food that the grandfather eats is the same as the father, is the same as the son, is the same as the grandson, and therefore the same disease runs in the family. And I for sure didn't want to inherit all that from my ancestors. And so it just made sense to switch to a vegetarian diet. I've been vegetarian, like I said, more than 30 years. I've not even thought of touching any sort of meat. A few years ago, a friend of mine started experimenting with veganism. Mm. And um, I, was, I was a person who really liked cheese. So veganism was like out of the question. Mm. Uh, but he's a dear friend and Araba, you know, he, he, I think we, we were in Dubai together at one point and again, beautiful kitchen. So he said, I, it's okay, I can have today. I said, no, you, you know, he, he just six months 
into the thing i said i will make hmm. vegan food let me take it as a challenge in dubai it's easy to get ingredients so i myself was very impressed with what i cooked <laughs> this is really telling good me stuff. today i'm waiting for <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i said this is not bad you know and then i started really exploring it and i felt that this is one more way i can contribute to the betterment of the planet and to the betterment of myself yeah yeah uh, and so it became easy so now, there I'm is not no... a, like a strict vegan so i will have honey huh i will have ghee uh but yeah i i don't really remember the last time i had milk unless it is medicinal like i took some ayurvedic stuff which had to be had in milk then i'll chupchap have it so i'm a kind of a flexible vegan uh not hardcore about it but again i have seen that the journey from being a vegetarian to a vegan really you know i i used to for example feel very sleepy in the afternoon go to sleep in the afternoon last two years i have hardly slept maybe 10 days in the afternoon it's because you've become a vegan yeah i attribute it to that because that's the only thing that changed everything else has remained constant oh and now that uh, you know we have done that uh, microbiome test uh, i am really excited waiting to see the result that comes to see that you know what are the things that i should be eating for even more energy for even better sleep because i am on a quest to really create health for myself the body for my body yeah uh what you didn't know, i don't ask me and don't know is uh, i am also an alternative healer so i practice something called craniosacral therapy which is a touch healing modality i uh, i am a trainer with the batch center uh, batch flower remedies uh, batch center uk hmm. i teach all their programs uh so i am a great believer in holistic health and that the traditional medicine the, the allopathic medicine has its place mm. in an emergency that is great but if you are practicing holistic health hopefully no emergency will happen mm. you know so yeah see so earlier talked about this generational pass on of mm. ailments and then you touched on the gut part you want to expand a little bo more over there is to what it is the connection between the gut and <laughs> our generational uh, baggage so from look i am not a biochemist now i am a microbiologist but from what i understand uh, the microbes in your gut play a vital role in creating the life experience that you are having right now uh, the a lot of the hormonal reactions that are there in the body are created in the gut not the brain and there is a connection between the gut and the brain by the way do you know that the gut also has neurons everybody thinks neurons are only in the brain but a gut has neurons and the gut has as many neurons as your dog and you consider your dog to be intelligent so your gut is intelligent right and That's 90% intuition. yeah we say gut feeling right yeah. so 90% of the information goes from gut to the brain the gut is constantly telling the brain what to do and the brain only tells 10% to the gut uh if that is the case then keeping those little guys in there happy is just a good idea right and they become happy by the food you eat so really focusing on good healthy uh i would say vegetarian food it becomes a perog uh, because it's very very important if you are in the quest for good health so it's not more a morality thing or moral thing of going vegetarian it's more from the healthy for me or yes absolutely the morality is that look i have dogs and i really like my dogs mm. and we've had dogs through our life like my grandparents had a dog i had a dog as i was growing up you know and even right now my sister who lives in bombay she has three two three dogs right we have two dogs here i cannot imagine eating a dog then how can i imagine eating a chicken or a cow or a goat it's still an animal it's still if you cannot see a dog as food how can you see a chicken as food this is how i think we were talking about plants there uh, yeah. you want to talk about your point of view <laughs> because we we just talked about yeah. plants being sentient yeah but plants are sentient there is no doubt about it you know uh, there is one plant right out here yeah. i don't know whether you will believe in this or not uh, it's called a vinca rosea it's those little pink flowers 
the it's touch me not no no not, not that's mimosa ha uh, uh, little pink flowers that are there it's abundant in india that plant will usually flower through the year but sometimes it doesn't flower my my plant sometimes doesn't flower but if i in the evening so the, that flower is very good for uh, controlling sugar so mm. if you have two of those flowers every morning it's great for your uh, you know uh, sugar spikes it does not there are many things i tell the plant look i really want two flowers tomorrow morning can you please do it in the morning there will be exactly two flowers now you it's up to you to you know believe it or not but this is my experience with my plant which grows right here so there is no doubt about it that they understand they they can communicate if in some way you can all right yeah. however a plant in its life cycle offers itself to be eaten the flower itself has nectar which attracts the insects to it says come eat me because through the eating of the nectar the pollination happens and the plant propagates no animal will ever come to say you know i've got a really nice asian <laughs> <laughs> come eat it <laughs> right uh this is my submission that plants as part of their life cycle a mango tree produces mangoes to be eaten right yeah uh and hence i see that uh plants the we we are in symbiotic relationship with the plants we breathe out the carbon dioxide which they take in and create oxygen for us right so there is this symbiotic relationship that is there between us and plants but we do not have a symbiotic relationship with an animal in that sense that look i will feed you but after you know 3 months i'm going to eat you hmm. that according to me is not what the animal signed up for when they started eating food from you so what we thought yeah <laughs> so just bringing us back to how far we've come for any change that one goes through it's important to first understand power is within you absolutely then it's important to understand the power of the mind and along with the power of the mind understand the gut and the mind connection and there in comes the food that we take which manages a whole lot of our external um distractions if i can call it that to manifest the power within you what else is really important in this process <laughs> <coughs> movement exercise this is very important you know as we evolved we evolved through movement uh hunters and gatherers we were either running after something that we wanted to eat or running away from something that <laughs> wanted to eat changed. us yeah. right yeah. uh farmers they were working the whole day in the fields there was a lot of movement and the research has shown that our brain functions best in a multi sensory environment uh to bring in movement in your day is very important uh i think that is the last piece that we 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 would need to so you need to have great sleep mm. you need to be able to meditate mm. not just able to meditate but actually meditate mm. uh you need to check your diet mm. check your food mm. you need to get into the habit of moving every day um and this is quite insidious in the sense that you know even a person who's going to a gym and working out may be at risk because it's like you need to move about 200 300 400 steps every hour hour and a half that's what your body needs to function at its optimal every hour every hour to hour and a half so um, mobile phone don't ever sit and take the call walk <laughs> you're sorry i i had a i have a friend who actually does all his meetings uh, walking. walking i do itself. too i do yes. too Yes, and I Unless thought we are recording. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we should have tried that. That would have been better. <laughs> I think the last part is you mentioned about it, sleep, and you've written a book as well about sleep. And sleep, I understand, is the biggest problem for many of us. Uh, you were talking about uh, when we talked about the ring, mm. about your uh, thing with sleep as well. Tell me, first of all, how bad is it when you don't have sleep? To what really happened how did you go about <coughs> discovering sleep 
so i never paid much attention to sleep foolishly thinking that if i meditate i don't need to sleep as much well, by then you had already understood meditation mm, you had figured yeah. all of that i'm talking about about 10 years ago so you so i've been meditating 20 years okay all right mm. but i used to have crazy schedules like uh, i remember there, there would be times when i would fly to america mm. and i would get off the plane and 3 hours later i'm teaching a course mm. in my completely zombified jet lag state right so sleep would be all over the place food would be all over the place uh in that sense i think i really abused my system mm. the good thing was because i was meditating because i was vegetarian because i did not have any of the other in quotes vices my body coped really well for a very long time mm. uh but at one point i started seeing that oh you know didn't have good sleep tonight happens to everybody then it started happening twice a month it started happening twice a week i still didn't get the message until one day i got a full blown panic attack now you have no idea what a panic attack is until you have it and i for wish that nobody ever has it because it's one of the most unpleasant things that can happen to you uh, there was a logical part of my brain saying what's the what's going on and at the same time there was this overwhelming fear so bad that at that that particular night i a doctor had to come and give me an injection to sedate me that mm. was the only way i could sleep i thought okay it's done and over fine something happened who cares until it happened again a week later hmm and then it happened again once when i was flying and for me a person who has traveled to 40 countries now you've never had panic attacks before never okay. i had no idea hmm i couldn't even sit in a plane and go from bangalore to bombay it would just trigger as soon as i would go near the airport it would trigger and so slowly 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 i was like i don't want to get out of the ashram ashram you know and i would justify to myself that ashram is such a beautiful place why should i why should i go to jayanagar right until i realized that i was really cocooning myself in hmm. and chotu things would start triggering this thing in me my meditation practice kept me sane as well as the support of my very dear friends who took care of me at that time right i have to acknowledge my doctor who finally i went to my very allopathic doctor i went to her she said i am not going to give you any medication uh you know yoga meditation you fix yourself because any medication for this is going to be a path of addiction god bless that she said that to me and then i took it as a challenge on myself you know i know how to research that's one thing i learned in iit so i ironically those nights i couldn't sleep i sat and researched about sleep hmm. and i went through countless websites white papers books and when i removed the science out of it i found that there are just a few simple things that you need to do seven eight things that you need to do which will fix your sleep right by that time i was a full blown insomniac like i couldn't sleep 5 6 7 hours in the night i would sleep during the day if at all i started implementing those things and what had been uh, going on with me for 3 4 years got sorted in 3 4 months and i am a person who does not mind talking about these things what are those seven well one is for example watching a sunset oh. very important it uh, tells your body that the day is coming to an end and that the sleep cycle has to be started now most people are in artificial lighting so the body doesn't understand that day is over night has begun right so simple things like that it's it's having an early dinner yeah. right uh, you need about 3 hours to 4 hours to digest a vegetarian meal right now if you have your dinner at 10:30 or 11 the night which is what i used to routinely do your digestion gets over at around 2 am 3 am right it is only then that the body starts actually doing the work that it's supposed to do in sleep because digestion is the first priority for the body right so you may be sleeping but you're not getting the benefit of sleep hmm. so like that there are just simple simple lifestyle changes that you need to make and i started making those changes and i was like my god i can i'm sleeping really well i reclaimed my sleep i reclaimed my health i reclaimed my smile i started traveling all over the world again i i read this in this uh this is uh what is his name matthew walker's yeah matt um, walker 
yeah. book uh, on sleep, yeah. right? I I read one line that sort of stuck me uh, stuck around with me. It says, "Sleep is the only legally uh, allowed sort of drug that allows you to." sort of nature's best shot at immortality exactly so, thank you <laughs> it's not able to yeah. recollect the verbatim of yeah. it yes or oh, what was interesting was dinesh who stays with me yeah didn't have any sleep issues but i kind of if i'm doing it you blood <laughs> <laughs> and he was lifting much more in the gym he was surprised at the energy levels that he suddenly had so even if you think you're sleeping well and he was sleeping well by incorporating these changes into your life suddenly you will feel 10 15 20 years younger and that's like astounding so i started telling people and people started benefiting and then of course the baba oh, you should write a book and, and i didn't learn from the first two mistakes <laughs> so i actually wrote the third book you know <laughs> because writing a book especially for a person who is a perfectionist like me i'll finish the book in about 8 months to 98% the other 2% takes two more years <laughs> that's part of uh, another thing that i notice is for someone who's a perfectionist <laughs> procrastination and perfectionism they sort of go like you know yeah. they complementary skills yeah, in you, some way you're ways. just not ready to release it ready to release it until the publisher says you know october 10th it's going into print whether you like it or not <laughs> <laughs> so if i do my sleep correct Hmm. and i follow all of this by the way that advice on the sunset i have to tell you a story i never knew the power of it till covid happened so we live by the lake and so every day at 5:30 my husband and i would go sit in the terrace to watch the sunset what started off is just one day two day it became a routine right. for the last for that full one hmm. and a half years and i saw there's so much calmness absolutely, absolutely. there's a lot of calmness yeah. in yeah. everything like you just feel like you're a miniature dot in yeah. this whole universe kind of a thing is that what you went through yeah kind of so this whole change process you started at 20 yeah. you're still going through it yes where, where are you now i went to a very good place uh but i do know that i can be at an even better yeah. place and i'm always looking for ways to get to be even better a seed is perfect it's perfect and that little sprout that comes out that's perfect and the little shrub that that it becomes is perfect and the young tree is also perfect and the grand old tree is also perfect so our journey is moving from one perfection to another perfection yeah yeah i love and this love that's this. that has been how i approach me and everything i do i love this i love this uh baba we have a bunch of uh, rapid fire of questions of course please go ahead so baba first one um meditation is all about focus and concentration is that true focus and concentration is the result of meditation meditation is drawing the arrow back focus and concentration is releasing the arrow wow wow that was brilliant meditating means you empty your mind meditation may end up empty, emptying. emptying your mind but it is not necessary that you have not meditated simply because you have thoughts like the thoughts are like the uh, waves. waves on the ocean but if you go inside it's calm and still so the the technique is to be able to jump through the waves and go into that place. wow and meditation is difficult oh no you said 10 minutes you learnt it in 10 minutes it takes yeah 15 minutes 20 you practice every day 20 minutes it's like 3 hour course 5 days you're done 15 hours is it free no okay so it takes years of dedicated practice to receive any benefits from medication meditation 40 days this is an mit research 40 where days they, where they took uh mri scans of meditators and saw that their brains are very very different from uh non meditators then they took non meditators and made them meditate and in 40 days they saw significant changes in their brains so 40 days scientifically proven 40 days how... 20 minutes and that's what it is yeah. resist that yeah if everyone meditated the world would be a better place i definitely think so <laughs> so then For why sure. isn't it free 
don't you think I deserve a good life as well? So this starts with the first conversation that we had. Right. Yeah. Uh, that is one thing. The second thing is we did experiment a lot with free models. We found that people wouldn't even complete the course. And if they did, they wouldn't practice it. Yeah. And the point is, we want to really create a difference in people's lives. Yeah. See, that is why our courses are not priced at a few lakhs. Yeah. Courses are 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 bucks, yeah. which is peanuts doable. these days. It's doable. Right? Yeah. And if you're seeking personal change, growth, meditating is as efficient or more than having therapy? More. I would say more. More? I would say more, but meditation and therapy together is dynamite. Is it like hypnotism? No. Hypnotism, the mind is still there. Meditation, mind ex doesn't exist. And Gone. is it like running away from your problems? No. In fact, someone asked this. Is it, is it is meditation escaping from reality? I said, no, it is escaping to reality. Tell me a little more. The reality is that we are all connected, that we are all one. On an intellectual level, knowing this is one thing. On an mm. experiential level, Knowing this is completely different. It completely changes the way you look at everything. 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 And that's where you've evolved from me, I, to growing the I part. And then it became, okay, let me see what else I can do with my friends, yeah. which is where the inclusion in that came in. And now it is about a larger yeah. community. And that's the evolution that you've been going through. You know, we are all, human beings are all, genetically programmed, I think, to be altruistic. See, you go to a great restaurant, you don't keep it to yourself. You tell people, ah, man, wow, fantastic food. You see a great movie, the producer, director, actor, they are not paying you anything, but you... Go tell about it. Right? Yeah. So, we inherently want to share good experiences with others. That's what I've been doing. I had a fabulous experience when I did the Art of Living course all those years ago. I am still sharing it. <laughs> well, Baba, thank you so much. Thanks. This is such a Thanks. lovely conversation. It was a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Thanks for thank you. doing this.